Every year of my life, that's almost 52 years so far, the world has become a worse and worse place. Every year we have polluted more water than the year before. Every year there's been less clean air than there was the year before that. Every year there are fewer, fewer species on the planet than the year before that. We're driving 200 species a day to extinction. Every year there's fewer salmon, every year there's fewer carnivores. We're about to see that turn around. The loving planet is about to make a comeback. And that's really, really good news. And I want to talk about that today within the context of discussing these other matters. So I'm going to, this is the outline for my talk. I'm going to talk about the myth of sustainability, sustainability of the myth. So in that light, I'm going to talk about the importance of durability and then talk about the twin sides of the fossil fuel coin, which is mostly what I speak and write about global climate change and energy decline or peak oil. And then describe a little bit about some templates for durable living arrangements in the future. Sustainability is a myth as indicated by the second law of thermodynamics. Things break down, entropy. It's a law. It's not a strong suggestion. It's the second law of thermodynamics. As an example, we emerge from the void, we take a few blinks, we go back into the void, and that's at the level of every organism. Think about the human lifespan at the level of every culture, including industrial culture in which we are enmeshed, and every species. Homo sapiens, if we stop today, if our extinction comes tonight, say, then we will have lasted about one-seventh as long as the typical species of mammal couple hundred thousand years. That's not long at all when you consider the run of the universe, for example, just this one little universe from amongst the multiverse. As, and I already mentioned the second law of thermodynamics in particular, although the laws of thermodynamics generally preclude sustainability. And if you, if you need one more reason why sustainability is a myth, understand this. Who has the world's largest sustainability program? That would be Walmart. If that doesn't convince you that sustainability is a myth, I don't think there's anything I can say that would. Cheap plastic crap at Walmart is not about sustainability. Neoclassical economics assumes that we will always find substitutes that we can continue infinite growth on a finite planet. As a consequence, Obsolescence is built in. And particularly since World War II in this country, we make everything so that it's a throwaway object. Think about cars. Since World War II, every car gets a remake every year so that everybody can tell, oh, you're not driving the 2012 Prius. You're driving the 2011 Prius. It's got those funny chrome wheels. You really should have the 2012. That's what designed obsolescence is all about. Make us feel like we need to com consume more stuff. Biophysical economics has been proposed within the last 15 years or so. The leading champion is a guy named Charles Hall at State University of New York. The only person I know denied tenure at an Ivy League institution the same week he made the cover of Science for his work on energy doing excellent work in the realm of biophysical economics, which recognizes that we live on a finite planet, therefore there are limits to growth, and therefore that conservation might be a good idea instead of built-in obsolescence. Even the New York Times in late 2008 had an article that concluded neoclassical economics is dead, and the only way forward is biophysical economics. Of course, in every issue of the New York Times before and after that, they abandoned that notion. But there is a glimmer of hope there for one day on page E27 in the fourth column. It was very exciting for me when it happened. I want to talk about climate change, and I'm going to call it climate chaos because it's well underway. This is not gradual change. This is climate chaos. In late 2007, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the noted IPCC, using a consensus process, which is very conservative, concluded that we're headed for a one degree C temperature increase by 2100. We had at that point experienced a 0.8 degree C 
degree temperature increase. So if it doesn't seem at all outrageous that we would in, enjoy another 0.2 degree temperature increase in the next 100 years, I can imagine how you might think that's a fairly conservative assessment. Merely for elucidating the obvious, the IPCC was awarded a share of the Nobel Peace Prize. A year later, the Hadley Center for Meteorological Research in England concluded that we're headed for a two degree C temperature increase by 2100. Now, two degrees C doesn't sound like much. It doesn't sound like any big deal at all. But in fact, two degrees C is absolutely huge. Two degrees C kicks into play several positive feedback loops that almost certainly lead to six degrees C and in the short term thereafter, a runaway greenhouse. Two degrees C, by every assessment I've read, indicates a near-term transition to human extinction. The Hadley Center for Meteorological Research was established by that wacky liberal Margaret Thatcher. So this is not exactly a left-wing <coughs> liberal organization. This is a very conservative assessment. And it indicates we're headed for our extinction in the not-too-distant future. United Nations Environment Program, six months later, concludes we're headed for three and a half degrees C by 2100. Each of these models and assessments relies on an increasing amount of data, increasingly sophisticated models, and supercomputers that run ever faster. So you can imagine the computers we had in 2007 were basically the equivalent of the abacus for those of you who are 20 years old. You know, that's forever ago. That's like a telephone where you actually have to stand there and dial the phone. And you, and you dial, you're making sparks. Right? I mean, that's how old that technology is relative to today's standards. So we have much better information at this point. The United Nations and Fire Program says we're headed for three and a half degrees C by 2100. The Hadley Center comes along not long after the previous assessment and says four is the new two and it's coming by mid-century. This is huge. This is unimaginably huge. It was ignored, of course, by all the major media outlets. Four degrees C almost certainly is the final nail in the coffin for the human experience is coming <coughs> as early as mid-century. The really bad news, I have half the screen left. Consistent with four degrees C temperature increase by mid-century, the Copenhagen Project and the Global Carbon Project, and rather the Copenhagen Diagnosis, concluded that we're headed for six or seven degrees C by the end of the century. And that's what happens when you set positive feedbacks into motion. Now, interestingly, none of these assessments include those positive feedbacks. None of these include positive feedbacks, including the International Energy Agency's report from just over a year ago of three and a half degrees C by 2035. Or how do you like the United Nations Environment Program just over a year ago, 6.4 degrees C by mid-century. 6.4 degrees C. The last time it was six degrees C warmer than baseline on this planet, there were snakes the size of yellow school buses living in the Amazon, and the largest mammal was the size of a shrew, because that's the largest mammal that can thermoregulate at those kind of temperatures. I gave a talk in Petoskey a couple of days ago, and it was preceded by a showing of the film, National Geographic film, Six Degrees Could Change the World. The film was released in 2006, and they went through every one degree C temperature change up to six degrees C. And at six degrees C, it's a truly, truly dire outcome for human beings and every other organism on the planet. There is little question that if 6.4 degrees C doesn't cause our extinction by 2050, that it won't come long after that. The really bad news is that none of these models none of these assessments take into account positive feedbacks. National Center for Atmospheric Research just over a year ago 
put out the only comprehensive assessment to include positive feedbacks, and they indicate we're headed for 16 degrees C world by 2100. That's hot. I have good news though. The bad news is that none of these assessments take into account positive feedbacks. The good news is that none of them take into account collapse of the industrial economy. So there may be a way to allow our species to persist a few more generations. Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, one of the premier journals in all of the sciences, concludes that climate change is irreversible over temporal spans relative to, to human beings. That is, the CO2 that's in the atmosphere today is there for at least the next thousand years. The planet cannot sequester carbon from the atmosphere nearly as fast as we're putting it up there. So we're at 394 parts per million for at least the next thousand years. At the start of the Industrial Revolution, we had 250 parts per million. We're almost at 400 already. That's unbelievably rapid change. United Nations Environment Program points out that during 2008, global carbon emissions actually increased. This was a stunning surprise because some of you remember 2008 as the year of the Great Recession. The year we stopped calling them, the year we called it the Great Recession because we never call anything a depression anymore because that's too depressing. So it's just a recession. During the Great Recession, the, the industrial economy of the planet was not slowed enough to re reduce carbon emissions. They set a record. The record, of course, has been shattered three times since then. And last year, 2011, we set an all-time record by increasing carbon emissions 6.5% over the year before, which is a 6% increase over the year before that. We're in exponential increase land when it comes to carbon emissions. A paper rejected by several journals before it was accepted and published in the very prestigious journal Climatic Change, published in November 2009, says only economic collapse will prevent runaway climate change. It's published by Tim Garrett at the University of Utah in the November 2009 issue of the prestigious journal Climatic Change. And it might be too late. According to a paper in Science, from about a year ago, the Arctic is defrosting, which means that warm Atlantic water, instead of reversing course at Greenland, is shooting through the Fram Strait off the north and eastern Greenland coast straight into the Arctic, producing the warmest years on record in the Arctic in the last two years, and the years with the lowest snow mass and ice mass observed in the Arctic in recorded history. That's one of five positive feedbacks that we've kicked into play. It's a positive feedback because the more warm water that goes up there, the more the ice melts. The more the ice melts, the more open water is exposed. The albedo is reduced so there's less, uh, trans less reflectance off the ice back into space. So the water is warming and as that water warms, the ice melts and the water warms and the ice melts. So that's one positive feedback. There are four more. Peat in the world's boreal forests is combusting, and that's a huge carbon source that used to be a carbon sink. As it gets drier, more of that carbon is combusted and sent up to the atmosphere, which makes it drier and hotter, which makes more of that peat combust and go up to the atmosphere. Another positive feedback. Two years ago, in the summertime, summer of 2010, a bunch of researchers went out into Siberia and, and showed off, you can see a bunch of this stuff on YouTube, they showed off by lighting, the, lighting Siberia on fire. There was these big methane vents that they could light on fire. It looked really cool. You, know, you strike a match and this thing goes It was great sport for scientists on YouTube. That was 2010. 2011, nobody was lighting anything on fire in, this, in Siberia because those vents were several kilometers across. You don't want to light that on fire. You're going to lose your mustache. Just in a year, we went from isolated vents to kilometers across these methane vents. Methane is 25 to 27 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. Every molecule of methane is huge. 
when it comes to climate change. Fourth, positive feedback. We are also releasing <coughs> methane hydrates or methane clathrates from the deep sea as that ice is exposed, exposed. And fourth, we have a drought in the Amazon 2010 that produced more carbon than the United States. The Amazon is supposed to be a carbon sink. In the summer of 2010, it became a carbon source when drought was causing decomposition to occur so rapidly that the carbon loss was greater than all the cars and trucks in this, and coal-fired power plants in this country combined. This is huge. Only economic collapse will prevent runaway greenhouse at this point. It might be too late, but I don't want us to act as if it's too late because then it becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. Then we, then we assure extinction of our species by 2050. And I don't think that's a good idea. With respect to economic scenarios, I, I want to point out how quickly uh, a large legitimate organization, like this large French bank, forecast that the industrial economy can reach its, its end. In mid-2009, after the Great Recession was over, Societe Generale warned its clients as one of three equally weighted forecasts that they should prepare for collapse of the world's industrial economy within two years. Obviously that didn't happen. We're past mid-November 2011, so that didn't happen. The World Bank predicted in mid-January 2012 that the coming downturn will be worse than that of 2008. Now, in 2008, in September in fact, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, Ben Bernanke, concluded that we came within a hair's breadth of losing Western civilization. We were so close to the brink, nearly every bank failed in the United States except one. He admitted this years after the events of September 2008 brought down AIG and Lehman Brothers. But he did admit later that the events of that period nearly terminated Western civilization. We're headed for a downturn, according to the World Bank, worse than 2008 in the relatively near term. These 75 individuals predict that global economic collapse will be complete by the end of this year. And none of these people are using the Mayan calendar to come up with that assessment. The latest person to join the party is George Soros, multi-billionaire who, I can assure you, does not want economic collapse to occur. If economic collapse occurs, what that means is money is worthless. On July 5th, 2010, Niall Ferguson, the Harvard professor of history, social critic, and sometime economist and philosopher, predicted that economic collapse would be complete within two years, which suggests July 5th of this year. But last week, he said there's a way out. This is a, this is a Harvard professor of history, Niall Ferguson. He says the way out is to bomb and occupy Iran for their oil. Even the lefties have joined the brigade. The only exception from amongst all these people who doesn't predict global economic collapse by the end of this year is Dmitry Orlov. That's why there's an asterisk beside his name. Orlov wrote the book Reinventing Collapse, the Soviet Example and American Prospects. And in that book, and for years before that, Orlov has been predicting five stages of collapse, financial, commercial, governmental, social, and cultural. And he was sticking with that up until October 30th of last year. October 30th of last year, he announced that clearly he was wrong. That because of the steps taken by central banks and governments around the world, we don't have a five-stage collapse, we have a two-stage collapse, and financial is done. So we have one stage left, it can happen any day. What's driving the potential for collapse of the industrial economy is peak oil. This slide shows the typical extraction pattern of finite materials, this bell-shaped curve. These are the data, these points. 
And this curve was drawn by Marion King Hubbard in 1956 based on these data points up to here, up to 1956. The presentation in 1956, Marion King Hubbard, a petroleum geologist working for Shell Oil Company, announced three predictions in describing how extraction of finite materials follows this curve. He said he expected the United States oil supply to peak in terms of extraction or production, as it's usually called, between 1969 and 1971. That peak came in 1970. He predicted the peak would be here at three billion barrels a day, and it, he was he considerably undershot, but he got the year exactly right. He forecast between 1969 and 1971, and it happened in 1970. In 1956, he predicted that we would pass the world oil peak in about a half a century. We passed the world oil peak in May of 2005, so he missed that by seven months, 50 years in advance. And the third prediction he made is that there would be significant cultural disruption in the wake of passing the world oil peak. Arab Spring, anybody? Occupy Wall Street? You want significant cultural disruption? I think it's well underway. Those are his three predictions from 56 years ago. After the U.S. peaked, the United States government took the two steps it could take politically to accommodate the fact that our industrial economy mainlines cheap oil. The first of those strategies we know now affectionately is drill baby drill. So after the U.S. peaked right here, we drilled for oil where we found it, in that case Alaska, we opened up the North Slope. And we got an, another little shoulder of oil extraction in the wake of opening of the North Slope. But you can see that U.S. extraction or production is now down to less than half it was at peak. So that was the first political solution, was to drill where we have it, drill baby drill. The second solution is to get oil wherever we can. In, in the late 1970s, the last decent man in the Oval Office, in my opinion, Jimmy Carter, recognizing what it takes to maintain an empire in decline, established what has become known as the Carter Doctrine. The Carter Doctrine says that with respect to the Middle East or anywhere else in the world, that's our oil over there. In addition to drill, baby, drill, we have kill, baby, kill. Those are the two political strategies. 2008, we were importing 70% of our oil from foreign sources. sources. Now it's down to about 50% because of the ongoing economic issues in this country. We aren't using nearly as much oil as, as we used to be using because nobody can afford to drive anymore. And we're extracting the heck out of the tar sands. And according to a treaty we have with Canada, we get their oil before we, they do. That's our kind of treaty. That's the only kind of treaty we don't not pay attention to. It's the one that works seriously in our favor. So we're getting a huge amount of our oil from the tar sands, so we have to import less than we used to, which means we have to go to places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Somalia, South Somalia, and so on, to a lesser extent than would otherwise be necessary. Not that I'm, fan of, not that I'm a fan of the tar sands. Here's an example of what happens to countries or regions that peak late in the game because we have technology that can keep pushing oil out beyond the limits that we used to be able to through pumping salt water into the wells and so forth. Places like Mexico, which peaked late, go into catastrophic free fall rather than following the bell-shaped curve. They really collapse. So our number two supplier is in absolute freefall. It won't be long before Mexico is unable to export any oil, no matter how badly we need it, because they need it for their own uses. Oil, oil extraction follows the same pattern as oil discovery, and oil discoveries have been following since 1964. You can't drill it if it ain't there. 
And every time somebody discovers a huge find of oil somewhere on the planet, it makes the news. And by huge find, they mean something that ends with an illion barrels. We have illions and illions of barrels out there. But do the math. If somebody reports a three billion barrel fine, that's said to be a big, big number. Three billion barrel fine, we use 75 million barrels a day. Three billion barrels isn't gonna last long at 75 million barrels a day. World oil production peaked, or extraction peaked in 2005, assuming a 4% annual decline rate, which is a very conservative projection. We have access to the same amount of level same amount of oil at the world level in 2025 as we did in 1970 when there were less than half this number of people on the planet and the planet was far less industrialized. 12 cars in all of China and India, for example. Not very many people on the planet relative to today and not much desire for increasing industrialization beyond Europe, Japan, and the United States. Difficult for me to imagine we make it to 2025 with the lights on. This is a general pattern of what was predicted to happen and now what has happened in the wake of passing the world oil peak. And the blue line is the quantity of extraction. And you can see that we've been on an undulating plateau with very little increased oil availability since 2000. In fact, according to BP data, we hit that undulating plateau in 1998. Small wonder then that by every macroeconomic measure, the US economy peaked in 2000 including the major stock indices, which peaked in 1999 or 2000. So we've been in economic decline for a while now. The last superpower didn't take this long to fall. Once we hit that undulating plateau of oil extraction, the price, when demand goes up, the price goes up. And so in July of 2008, we saw the price of oil spike to $147.27 in the wake of the peak. And then, unexpectedly to most people, except petroleum geologists and economists who had been paying attention to what happens with oil, the price plummeted down to $34.20. Within six months, the price went from $147 to $34. That's what happens in the wake of peak. You get these huge fluctuations in price. That destroys all incentive and therefore potential for developing alternatives to oil. When price of oil got down below $100, T. Boone Pickens canceled his plans for wind farms all over the Great Plains. Matt Simmons canceled his plans for big wave energy to save the state of Maine. It just doesn't pay at those low prices. Price spiked again later to $126 and has been hovering down around the $110 mark. Since then, that price spike was in April. It hardly even matters that we have nearly a trillion barrels of oil left in the ground. That's largely irrelevant. What matters in terms of the industrial economy, in terms of economic recessions and ultimately economic collapse is the price of oil. Every worldwide economic recession since 1972 has been preceded by a spike in the price of oil. The bigger the spike, the more dire the recession. That's why it could be that this spike to $126 last April could be the nail in the coffin with a delay. There's always a delay after the price spike until the recession begins. And if you look at that $126 oil in April last year and compare it to $147 oil in July of 2008, price that in euros, it's the same price. It's 82 euros. Small wonder the entire eurozone is aflame at this point from an economic perspective. Small wonder that Athens, Greece, 
the birthplace of Western civilization. He was leading the way out for industrial civilization. The Pentagon announced, echoing the U.S. Energy Information Administration in their Joint Operating Environment 2010, that there would be no spare oil capacity by 2012. I suspect that's what drove the spike to $126 oil in April. And a 10 million barrel per day gap by 2015. 10 million barrels per day is a big deal. It doesn't sound like much, it's only an illion or so. But in fact, that's 15% of world consumption. 15% sounds like no big deal. I could use without 15% of the oil, right? I'll get along just fine. Okay, but the industrial economy mainlines cheap oil. Take 15% of your blood out and see, see how that turns out for you. I'm guessing you'll be a little sluggish for a day or two, or maybe even longer. 15% is absolutely huge. The U.S. Army announced in their Unified Quest 2011, which they put out late in 2010, that they were preparing for martial law in this country, preparing to implement martial law in what they forecast to be a series of huge cultural events triggered by an economic decline. I'm not at all surprised that the U.S. Army is preparing for martial law. I suspect they have been for a long time. But they let us know. This is a public document first released on CNBC. Ultimately, and I don't know if it's in 2012 or not, ultimately though, peak oil and the energy decline associated with peak oil leads to the greatest depression. What that means is massive unemployment, officially. So just as today, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that there's an eight point something unemployment rate, when in fact the real number is 25% they will be reporting considerably less than 100% unemployment. And everybody who's around will be working. That's not what I'm talking about. People will be working to produce their food and their water. They'll just be officially unemployed. As crude oil becomes less and less available, we will be distilling less and less of it into the usual distillates we think we need for transportation. What that means is no food in the grocery stores, no fossil fuels for air conditioning or heat, and no water coming from the municipal taps. What that means is no industrial civilization. And it's coming sooner than most people realize. I don't know if it's coming by the end of 2012, as the 75 core forecasters believe, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if it did. It wouldn't surprise me if when Greece defaults by missing their bond payment next month, that, that brings down the entire industrial economy of the world. It wouldn't surprise me if it didn't either. Energy decline leads to economic collapse and I want to point out a couple of reasons we should be joyous about that. In addition to the ones I pointed out in the beginning, the whole clean air, clean water, more salmon, more carnivore story. We can also look at the extinction rate. And as a proxy for extinction, what we have here is the number of species listed as threatened or endangered in the United States. And it tracks pretty closely with gross domestic product. The data stop in 2000, but that's okay because that's when the US economy stopped growing. So GDP flatlined at that point. And under the George W. Bush administration, we stopped listing threatened and endangered species. So that flatlined at this point too. So it's still on a one-to-one -one line. We're driving 200 species a day to extinction. I want you to think about that for a minute. 200 species a day, every life punishing day, we drive 200 species to extinction. At some point, one of those species is us because we depend on those species for our very survival, for our continued persistence on this planet. Never mind the moral imperative, whether we have the right to drive 200 species a day to extinction. At some point, the issue becomes far more pragmatic than philosophical. 
if we were to develop a durable set of living arrangements, and it's getting awfully late in the game for that, but if we are, we must recognize that the industrial economy is a subset of the environment, not the other way around, as most economists tend to think. Before I started speaking in Michigan, I would tell people, if you think the economy is more important than the environment, try counting your money while you're holding your breath. Well, most people in Michigan took out their wallet while they're holding breath and think, yeah, I'm done, what else you got? Nobody has any money anymore. The industrial economy is a subset of the environment, not the other way around. If we don't have a healthy biosphere, it doesn't matter how much money we have. Second thing a durable set of living arrangements must accomplish is to use only local materials. Brand earth is on our way out. No imports, no exports. And we'll be, we'll be forced to consume materials at the rate they are produced. Currently, we use soil and dump it into the Gulf of Mexico and use clean water and just contaminate it and foul it and use fossil fuels at a far greater rate than they are being produced by natural processes. And fourth and finally, we must rely on our local human community for support because there are no lone rangers in a durable set of living arrangements. What we have in this country is the antithesis of a durable set of living arrangements. We have an industrial economy built on consumption. In the wake of 9-11, what's the answer? Go to the mall. Prop up the economy, keep spending. 70% of our industrial economy is underlain by consumer spending by individuals. We must consume, consume, consume. And in fact, this set of living arrangements, suburban America, what James Howard Kunstler calls the worst misallocation of resources in the history of the world, this set of living arrangements requires us to live far from where we work, far from where we play, far from where we buy anything. So every time we want a tube of toothpaste, we have to make our third trip into town. This is absurdity defined. Consume, consume, consume. The politicians think it sounds like such a good thing, but then you look at the definitions and they don't sound that great to me. To waste or burn away, it's downright biblical. Since we don't have a durable set of living arrangements, what we require in this country to maintain an empire in decline is obedience at home, and this is in Alabama, and oppression abroad. Not to mention wholesale destruction of every aspect of the living planet. Obedience at home, that's Alabama, where several people were legally protesting illegal actions by their local banks, so the National Guard was illegally brought in to quash them. You think you have rights? Check the Patriot Act someday. Ray McGovern, is, last year, was a 71-year-old retired CIA analyst who prepared the daily intelligence briefing for four presidents. Ray McGovern stood up and turned his back on Hillary Clinton in a silent demonstration of his First Amendment rights when she was speaking in a public place. That's all he did, he stood up and turned his back. Now in, in 2000, when George W. Bush was running for president, that happened many times. A lone student would stand up when George W. Bush was speaking, turn his back silently on the future president of the United States who was campaigning. And then several students would notice what was going on, they'd stand up too, and pretty soon a quarter or a third of the students in the room were expressing their First Amendment rights to freedom of expression by turning their back silently on the speaker. Ray McGovern, 71 years old, stood up and turned his back on Hillary Clinton when she was speaking. This is the man who prepared the daily intelligence briefing for four presidents. He's known in Washington, D.C., where this event took place. The security force came and beat him bloody and threw him in jail. What a difference a decade makes. We have become a totalitarian surveillance police state. Obedience at home, oppression abroad. We get what we want. And the costs don't matter. Just make sure my gas is cheap so I can get to the mall. Erin Dotty Roy wrote in her 2001 book, Power Politics, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. 
And once you've seen it, keeping quiet, saying nothing, becomes as political an act as speaking out. There's no innocence. Either way, you're accountable. Finally, too late in an unexamined life, I realized I was accountable. So I walked away. I walked away from a, from a life I loved, teaching at a major, major university, teaching poetry in prisons, teaching honors students and others. And I loved that life, but you cannot teach you cannot point out the dark underbelly of industrial civilization and live at the apex of empire and look at yourself in the mirror every day. I put my own spin on Aaron Dottie Roy's conclusion, pointing out that big energy poisons our water, big ag controls our seeds, big farm controls the behavior of our children, Wall Street controls the flow of money, big ag controls the messages you receive every day. The criminally rich get richer through crime. That's how America works. Through it all, we believe we're free. Yeah. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. What we have here at the apex of empire, here in the United States, the biggest and most violent, most destructive empire in the history of the world, is privilege. A huge amount of privilege. Most of that privilege results from transforming wildness into cities. If we are to thrive in the post-carbon era, if we're to thrive in any era, including the post-carbon era to come, we only need to take care of four things, four things that we have some control over. We need to secure safe water, healthy food, we need to maintain our body temperature at about 37 degrees Celsius, that's 98.6 if you're doing that in Fahrenheit. And we need to create and maintain a decent human community. We can do that. This ain't exactly rocket surgery. To use the line of the last presidential campaign, yes, we can. Actually, Barack Obama, knowing what was coming, said, yes, we can. He was talking about preserving peaches and pears. Yes, we can. And it goes through like a wave. <laughs> yes, we can do this. I, I'm going to present a couple of templates for durable living that have been proposed by others. One of those is transition towns. This is the one forwarded primarily by Rob Hopkins. That's the, that's the cover, uh, a picture from the cover of the book. And it shows windmills and solar panels and gardens dug up and turned in, lawns dug up and turned into gardens. And that piece of paper that's going around, that little notebook that's going around, has you signing up to learn more about the transition town movement. If economic collapse doesn't come this year, and I don't know that it will, and I don't know that it won't, it's coming. Energy decline assures it. We cannot sustain the unsustainable indefinitely. So I would encourage you to pursue something like the transition town movement, or as I live now in agrarian anarchy. Anarchy is not chaos, as it is so commonly confused. Anarchy is a system of governance in which individuals rely on themselves and their neighbors and take responsibility for themselves and for their neighbors. I live in agrarian anarchy at the edge of empire in a small community where I take responsibility for myself and for my neighbors, and those neighbors are humans and otherwise. If you think agrarian anarchy is wacky, think about Henry David Thoreau, mm -hmm. or more recently, Wendell Berry, or that, that wacky Thomas Jefferson who built Monticello as an example of agrarian anarchy, as you see here in the picture. A third route, and I present this primarily for the youngsters in the audience, because some of us are a little old to hit the road with our feet is to travel. And history has always been kind to travelers in any sort of environment. If you show up in Marquette, say, five, ten years from now, you will be revered as a local hero. You came all the way from Muskegon? What's it like down there? We don't have the internet anymore. We don't have television. 
Tell us what it's like down there. They'll feed you. They'll put you in a, in a bed. Life will be good. I mean, look at how happy these people are traveling. These people are walking. Look how happy they are. They're all smiling. These people on horses, happy as can be. They don't need cars, airplanes, none of that crap. Look, in the ship, well, you can't see them, but they're smiling. I can see them from here. These are happy people. Sailing ships. This is great stuff. Really, this is my best stuff. It's as good as it gets. So given ongoing and increasing climatic change, I suspect trying to mitigate in place is not a very good idea for most places. So I would encourage the youngsters in the audience in particular to be prepared for a nomadic style of life. And look how happy you can be doing that. It'll be great fun. What an adventure. It's not an apocalypse, it's an adventure. And finally, we have the post-industrial stone age. And at some point, with respect to electricity and water coming out of the taps and all that, we are headed for the post-industrial stone age. It's not the Neolithic, because we're still gonna have chairs and structures, amazing structures. And we're going to have knives and forks and televisions that don't work anymore. That's really good news. I haven't watched it in 20 years, but I recall it was really bad stuff. So at some point, we're headed for a future in which there's no electricity and no water coming out of the taps. So what that means, if you are able to forage for your food by picking the stuff off of the ground and knowing what's edible, your life is actually going to be quite good. In the Neolithic, people only worked a few hours a week, a few hours a week, to work to attain their food and water. And then spent the whole rest of the time doing artwork and inventing funky musical instruments and, and laying around and having sex and stuff. And, and now we spend 40 plus hours a week to do it, to get our food and water. We don't have time to lay around and do art and music and. I won't go into that at all. So those are, the, those are the four templates that I present to you as alternatives for our future. And I want to I finish by with, with two things. Pointing out yet again that in my entire life, the world has gotten worse and worse and worse every year by driving more species to extinction, by fouling more water, by fouling more air, by draining more of our soil into the Gulf of Mexico, and on and on it goes. And we get to see the world become a better place every year in the not too distant future. When we stop pummeling the earth, pummeling the tar sands into submission so that we can drive around a little bit more, so we can have a few dollars more, we're gonna see the world become a better place. The second thing I want to remind you is that there is that notepad going around with the transition town sign up <coughs> sheet on it. If anybody hasn't had an opportunity to sign up on that and you want to come on up afterwards and it'll be sitting right up here on this table. Thank you for your rapt attention. I would be ecstatic if you had any questions that I might be able to address. First question up, here you go. Take the microphone. If you ask a question, please take the microphone so everybody can hear it. All right, to start with, I agree that our industrial economy is built on basically a foundation of sand, but I'm afraid I don't share your optimism because I think humanity, we're just doomed to disagree endlessly on what to do next. <coughs> okay. I mean, you I'm know, not just looking at current politics. Do you really think anybody's good? I mean... The future is about to get a lot more local. Yeah, I would encourage you to work with local people, with your community, to <coughs> develop a durable set of living arrangements. It's time to walk away from the savior state long after the federal government, which we think is responsible for every aspect of our lives, apparently, <laughs> has abandoned us. So I'm not in favor of government. Government has not been in favor of you for a long time. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, point taken. 
Benito Mussolini and he ought to know define fascism as a merging of the corporations and the state. We're there. We've been there for a while. We're an oligarchic fascist police surveillance state. Oh, and to quote Herman Goering, of course the people don't want war, but after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine policy. And it doesn't matter if it's a democracy, a parliament, a fascist dictatorship, or a communist dictatorship. The people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. All that is necessary is to tell them that their country is under attack and to denounce the pacifists for a lack of patriotism and for exposing their country to greater danger. Good point. That's Goering, who worked for Hitler. You might remember him. It's time for us to abandon the government long after the government has abandoned us and start making our own sets of durable living arrangements at the very local level. That's what agrarian anarchy is all about. That's what transition towns are all about. So let's go there. Is it true that man has learned nothing from history? I can't remember. <laughs> My teacher told me that after all history, man has learned nothing because all we do is, he told us that Einstein cried when he found out that and he made nuclear because he knew man would one day make weapons from that. Well, Einstein, the, the direct quote, what he said, is that if I had known what they were going to do with it, meaning <coughs> turn his nuclear knowledge into nuclear bombs, if I had known what they were going to do with it, I would have become a shoemaker. Yes, he cried. And I cry every day. I cry every day for what we're doing to the living planet. It rips my heart out to know that we're driving 200 species a day to, the, to extinction every day and doing nothing about it. To know that we're ratcheting up climate chaos to the point that we threaten our very species with survival by mid-century. Have we learned nothing? Wouldn't surprise me at all, but I'm an optimist. So I'd like to think we can move forward given the knowledge that we have, if not as a society, then as individuals in communities. I, I do volunteer work where I talk to people about um, adjusting their own lifestyles and their own choices um, so that um, so that it can help them realize the impact that they have on the environment and the community. And I was just wondering with um, your writing, because I wasn't familiar with it until just recently my husband um, got side and said, you know, we should might want to go. And um, but I was wondering if well I have one question. Um, I kind of missed the part where you talked about the positive feedback, and, and after you talked about it, I'm like, that's not that positive. <laughs> so I was wondering where that, I mean, kind of understand what that meant. And, um, and then the, the last thing was, um, do you talk about in your series or in your book how people can have personal accountability and how, um, even though these things are true that you're talking about, how much change is going to require some individuals to make their adjustments? Yeah, those are good questions. Um, to answer the first question, positive feedback is a term that refers to when an event starts or a process starts, then the events that follow tend to positively push that process along. So yeah, it's horrific. It, it's negative from our perspective but it's a positive feedback definitionally, that's all. People call me negative all the time, I don't get that either. <laughs> and your second question, and it reminds me that if anybody wants a copy of the page proofs of my book, the electronic copy of the book, send me an email and I will send that to you for no charge. And you can find my contact information at Nature Bats Labs, which is GuyMcPherson.com. So go to GuyMcPherson.com, you can contact me, I'll send you a copy of the book. Are there changes we can and should make? Yes, and we better hurry. These are not little changes, however. Recycling is an apology for a punch in the face. We punch the planet in the face and then we say, oh, here, I'll recycle this. 
Like, what about reducing and reusing? Weren't there three R's back when we started this campaign? But two of those three R's don't help grow the economy, reducing and reusing. So we abandon that crap and go straight to recycling, which is irrelevant. Recycling is this much of the reduce, reuse, recycle problem. And so that's the one that corporations encourage us and our governments to pursue. There are large scale changes that we can make that will profoundly influence the ability of us and our communities to thrive in the years ahead. Yep. What else we got? Um, I had a question about the recycling system and how you feel about it. It seems like a lot of them are maybe a little more problematic than what they try and solve to begin with. Well, I, I'm not opposed to recycling, even though it is an apology after a punch in the face. And, and a, a properly executed recycling program can do a little bit of good. But in the larger scheme of things, since we abandon the notion of reducing our consumption, as well as redu reusing anything that might come along, recycling is really tiny in the grand scheme of things. Does that mean we shouldn't recycle? No, not at all. You know, that's the right thing to do. And, and we should live the way we do because it's the right way to live not because culture drives us in a certain direction. If we're going the way culture drives us, we're going right over the cliff. The problem is not that we're fish out of water. The problem is that we're fish in a river. We don't even know there's water, much less a land base or an ocean. Culture is a profoundly strong driver. But remember, only dead fish float with the stream. So can we do things? Yes. We should do them all. We should do everything we can, recycling included. Yeah, I, I guess I'm a little less uh, doomsday than you. Gee, I hardly ever hear that. Yeah, but uh, I wanted to know why uh, you think that technology is not going to uh, help us out of this uh, problem of climate change. And, Will there be replacements for peak oil that may not give us what we have with oil, but might be useful, such as, uh, I saw windmills in the transitional community, uh, solar, uh, and maybe other technologies that we don't quite have yet. Um, what other possibilities do you think are out there, or, or why do you think they're not going to come through? Well, at the level of society or the world, all technology is self-defeating. So it allows us to go further into human population overshoot and to further pummel other species into the abyss of extinction. So all technology does is help us as individuals. So at the level of individuals or communities, I would encourage us to take advantage of technology, recognizing that there are limits to technology. So let me give an example. Um, if we were to solarize the United States, just to solarize the electric grid, for example, that would require about six months worth of oil, so we'd have to give up driving and flying and all those other things we enjoy doing for a long time to solarize the United States. Never mind the rest of the world, because we've never minded the rest of the world for a long time. That gives us electricity. But we still don't have the liquid fuels we need to maintain the electrical grid. In addition, solar systems require some sort of means of storing the juice, as in batteries. Will we come up with, with better technology than we have now? Maybe, but I, I kind of hope not, because that drives us further down the road of human population overshoot, further down the road of driving species to extinction, further down the road, road of overheating an overheated planet. Are there technological solutions to climate change? Mm, several have been proposed, none have been implemented that come anywhere close to the necessary scale. Only economic collapse will prevent runaway greenhouse unless we come up some real whiz-bang technology within the next few months. And I just don't see that on the horizon. Remember, the industrial economy and its, its health or lack of health is dictated primarily by the price of oil, not by how much oil is available. 
All those technologies that would get us energy are derivatives of oil, not alternatives to oil. It takes a lot of oil to make a solar panel. It takes a lot of oil to make a windmill. Maintaining that windmill, that takes more oil. Oil is huge and we're using it as fast as we possibly can to drive economic growth, meaning to transfer money from you to the banksters. Can I just follow up real quick? Sure. Are you suggesting technology is not good only in the area of, of, of energy? Or, I mean, of course, technology is wonderful. It keeps people alive longer than they used to. Uh, we have much better lives than people did 150, 200 years ago in terms of, of uh, the qualities that are available, I think. They might all collapse, but, but, but I'm, what I'm suggesting is technology has brought some wonderful things to us. Why not in energy? Or, or do you disagree with the, is all technology? I think, uh, I don't think technology is bad at the level of individuals. That's why we keep pursuing it. Because for our individual lives it makes us more comfortable and makes us live longer and, 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 and uh, more satisfactory lives. But I do argue that it's self-defeating. As people live longer, what does that do? It increases human population overshoot. As we save more babies that would otherwise die, that increases human population overshoot as we generate more means of extracting materials and using them, that drives us further into human population overshoot. So, I'm not saying technology is bad. That depends on your perspective. Technology that we developed 100 years ago and 50 years ago and five years ago is making the situation worse in the future than it otherwise would have been. We live for two million years on this planet, two million years, the first two million years of the human experience were, were spent with what we would consider a complete lack of technology. And people lived happy lives. They didn't live as long as we do now, which is why they were maintained that, able to maintain that set of living arrangements for two million years, as opposed to the last few thousand years when we've had civilization in its broadest form and the last 150 years when we've had technology-driven civilization known as industrial civilization. Technology is great for us. I get a laptop. It's bad for our future. What are the costs of that laptop? Well, what are the costs of the cell phone? We mine coltan from the Congo knowing full well that it kills women and children. The only use of coltan is batteries for cell phones. The only place we get it at any, at any scale is from the Congo. And we don't care how we get it. That's the American way. Over here and then over there. Um, what you propose, I feel, is wonderful. But in, the, in light of how our nation and the world is, uh, with our government more or less controlled by Wall Street major banking interests, I don't think we can achieve what you want to do to, to reach radical democracy, small r, small d, an anarchical society where we're working in smaller units, the federalist kind of way we could. I don't think the companies are going to let us go there. I don't think they're going to let us, you know, out of, out of the rat race that we're in all that peaceably. Because I agree with you, the state is, is a violent uh, entity that, that wants to rule us. And the power behind it, we've lost it as a people. Voting doesn't matter. The parties don't matter anymore. You know, we're, we're screwed. I mean, it's all the power Wall Street has. They're not going to let us go that easy. We can't just hop off to a commune. I don't think they're going to let us go that easy. Do you? I think they'll be violent. They are increasingly violent and unwilling to let us live lives of relative freedom. I agree with that. That's why we need to terminate this set of living arrangements. And, and that'll be hard. You know, if you, if you act out against industrial civilization, you'll almost certainly be punished, we'll say. Imprisoned, tortured, maybe killed. We have a good excuse to not act. So the question is, 
Do you have the best excuse in the world to not act? Do you want the best excuse in the world to not act? Or do you want a world? I just think that when you postulate these ideas, you should say there's some danger involved. Oh. You should be more cautionary because... Of course there's danger involved. I know involved. what the state's about. I uh, felt the nightstick on my head. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. Of course the fascist surveillance police state, which I described in those terms, is not going to appreciate resistance. The second reason after the moral imperative, I went back to the land as an act of resistance. There's the moral imperative to the way we live as an act of resistance against the dominant paradigm to give me more time to spread these messages unappreciated by my previous employer. <laughs> And so on. The answers over here. Over here. Can, can you give us a better idea of the community that you live in, and what you do for heat and energy and food and substance? How how do you run that? I mean, um, I share the property with a young family, a small family of human beings, a couple, and their eight-year-old son, who's actually in charge. This is on 2.6 acres. And we grow almost all of our own food. And our water is supplied by two solar pumps and a hand pump, by rainwater harvesting off two roofs. And there's the nearby river, which worked for the first 12,000 people were first 12,000 years people were living there. That's the, that's the community in its narrowest form. And then there are a dozen people with whom we have a robust gift economy. And another 60 or 80 people with whom we have a periodic gift and barter economy. And there are mm, three or 400 people within five miles, I would say. And so it's a pretty rural area in which people have taken responsibility for themselves um, instead of relying on the government. Self-reliance is huge and hugely respected. You know, after I moved there, I thought for about two seconds of calling a plumber when I had a problem, and I thought, my God, they'll run me out. You just fix stuff, or you, you call your neighbor to, to get him or her to fill, help you fix stuff. Self-reliance is revered and expected. Appreciation that goes well beyond tolerance for other ways of living is appreciated. And it goes well beyond tolerance. So diversity in human lifestyles is a big deal there. So I, I know several multimillionaires and a bunch of people who live in uh, at, at a land trust that most people would most easily identify with if I called it an African village. It's 13 people sharing this property. There's a well in the center of the property. That's the only source of water. They pack water every day to their off-grid houses. They grow all of their own food. It sounds like an African village. It sort of looks like an African village. There are no African American people there, but it's modeled after that way of living. And then right up the road, there are those really, really wealthy people who we, we don't hold that against them or anything like that. But people live differently and they appreciate each other. And the, the best example I can think of is I went to a, to a housewarming and New Year's Eve party of one of my neighbors. I wasn't invited. That's kind of funny. There were, we were at another party, there were 20 of us, and two of the people were invited to this other party. So they said, hey, let's go up to, to their house, to their party. And so all 20 of us went. So 18 of us <laughs> crashed the party. And there were 150 people there. And, and the, the couple hosting the party are literary agents. There are, the, there are other houses on Madison Avenue, right? And, and their, their house, well, the, the room we were being entertained in was about the size of this room. That was the living room. It was ginormous. And I looked over at one point and standing in the corner was the literary agent, um, a cowboy who worked for the local cowboy, the, the local cattle company. And he's dressed to the nines, right? He's got his ostrich skin boots and his pearl button cowboy shirt and his vest and his nice hat and everything. And, and I'm thinking the literary agent and this guy are probably at opposite ends of the political spectrum. And the third person talking with them is from the land trust. And, and he's wearing a rope belt and no shoes. We've got a multimillionaire literary agent a cowboy dressed to the nines because it's an opportunity to go out, and a guy from the land trust, and they stood there and talked to each other for 45 minutes as if they cared about each other, which they do. This is a really big deal. 
if we're going to thrive in the years to come, it'll be because we implement the kind of creativity and compassion and courage we are capable of demonstrating as human animals in the world. That's the only way forward. Thanks for coming here. And I, I wanted to just address a couple of things. Can we just admit that war and violence is another form of design or planned obsolescence? And you know, we're in a state here in a position in the world where we have an abundance of water, but we've also poisoned and you know taken a lot of risks with our survivability. Um, let's talk about how policies driven maybe by the marketplace have really uh, caused us to do development in places that were not sustainable, and we're trying to backtrack from that, but um, I mean, worldwide, we have this problem. So how do we readdress men's nature to kill one another? And are, are you kind of predicting that our own um, survivability as a human species is inevitably doomed? In answer to the latter question, no. I'm not proposing that at all. We lived the first two million years of the human experience in small communities close to the land. Did people kill each other? Oh, yeah. Uh, you only have to look at the invention of the flamethrower to understand that at some point somebody thought that was a good idea because it would kill people faster and more horrifically. I hate to invoke human nature here, but maybe Maybe we are programmed to go beyond defense and towards offense. Ron Pryor in the movie, What a Way to Go, Life at the End of Empire, the most important film I've ever seen, says that when a group contacts another group, one of three things happens. When, they, when, a, when a violent tribe comes onto a land held by another tribe, one of several things can happen. The violent tribe can quash and enslave the existing tribe, which allows the dominant paradigm of violence and destruction to persist. They can be rebuffed in war by that tribe, which allows the dominant paradigm of violence and hierarchy to persist. Or they can kill them all or run them all off, which allows the dominant paradigm of violence and hierarchy to persist. That suggests that this paradigm of violence and hierarchy might be built into the system. We, at this point, are the most violent society in the history of the planet. The most omnicidal set of living arrangements we could have developed is what we did. Is there a way out? I think there is one way out, and that's to stop living in an industrialized economy. Will we willingly go to a more durable set of living arrangements? such as characterized the first two million years of the human experience? Derek Jensen has asked that question to thousands of members of his audience, and he has never had a single person raise their hand and say yes. Will we willingly go there? Will we voluntarily go to that set of living arrangements? Now, I don't know that he has many native peoples in his audience because a lot of First Nations or indigenous <laughs> people never left that set of living arrangements, despite the sparkly lights of a few dollars more. I, I don't know the answer to that question, except that I can't imagine a more horrific, violent set of living conditions than we have right now. I, I can't imagine it getting worse if we change, even if, we, if the change comes unwillingly, involuntarily. And I'm an optimist. I don't think so, because where I live, we value compassion more than money. We value life over death. People can do that. In addition, we're past peak for everything that really matters to civilization, to industrialized society. So I don't think we can build an industrialized base again. 
We passed the world oil peak. We're at or near the world coal peak. We passed the world uranium peak in 1980. Uh, we're, we're past peak production of food. I mean, everything we think we need, for we passed peak silver many years ago, peak gold as well, peak phosphorus, and so on. Everything we need or think we need to feed all these people in this set of living arrangements, that's all expensive now. I don't think we can rebuild starting from scratch, fortunately. Are you going to ask the question she was trying to ask that I never figured out what it was? Because I'm still not going to figure it out, I'm just telling you. Um, I wanted to ask a related question. <laughs> but actually, um, I keep getting this wrong. If, um, if I can explain the way that I read the question, it's that we live in, um, we live in a society where there's already a lot of racial and class stratification, and we're already faced by a lack of resources. People in cities especially people of color and poor people in cities are already living in vulnerable conditions. And let's get over the white guy, what your perception of the white guy guilt trip, because that's not, I don't think, what either of us are trying to do. But you have the ability to go out and live you know, in a rural community. And I have the ability to travel to one and work in one and learn lots of great skills. Um, but not everyone has the ability to do that. Not everyone has access to those. To, I have access to a car, you know, I have access to a lot of things to go do that. I think what my friend was getting at was how would you advocate as a society that we deal with <coughs> access to resources in order to make a transition into more durable and sustainable communities? At the level of a global or national society? Um, I would think of it being national or regional. Well, we don't because our national leaders are interested in getting what we think we need to sustain our industrial economy. They are not interested in redistribution of wealth. They're interested in bombing the Middle East and Northern Africa to get oil. Okay, well then let's talk about it on a community level. Like you're speaking in mm -hmm. Muskegon, which is a very racially mixed it, everything in the future is going to be local, so let's tackle things at a local level. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, we're we're going to have to have a huge amount of creativity in the years ahead, and we know better than to go back to systems that contributed to the building of this culture. So we need not go back to slavery. We know better than that, and, and particularly slavery based on race. Will we willingly work together? Well, it's interesting because de Tocqueville thought so. He thought that's what made Americans exceptional, actually. And Dmitry Olov, in his wonderful book, Reinventing Collapse, the Soviet Example in American Prospects, compares the two superpowers and concludes that the Soviets were better prepared for collapse than the United States on every axis. And he compared dozens of them, except one. On one axis and one axis alone, the United States has a citizenry that is better prepared for collapse than the Soviet Union was. And that axis is our ability to work together in the face of catastrophe. According to him, Soviets would just as soon slit their throats as work together for the, for the good of a group. In my experience, when there's a catastrophe in this country, people run to it. They don't run away from it. They try to help. So I think, without a, invoking American exceptionalism, that we will rally together, put our shoulders to the wheel when it matters at the local level. That's our history. If you know your neighbors, you're going to be in a lot better shape to do that than if you don't. So 
I would suggest you get to know your neighbors. A longtime colleague of mine, a professor at Oklahoma State University, sent me a Facebook message yesterday. He just wanted to share with me that he's, he's probably the most liberal person in all of Stillwater, Oklahoma. He wanted to share with me that his um, neighbor, who he describes as extremely conservative, comes over across the fence one day and says, hey, do you mind if I get some chickens? Uh, they're going to be a little loud and I don't want to disrupt the neighborhood. And my friend Sam says, no, chickens would be great. that would be fine. And this guy says, because you know, this whole shit's coming down pretty soon and we're going to need to grow our own food in this community. So Sam says, get you a beer? Let's come on into my house. And so they talked about collapse and developing good neighborly relations. These are two people who, under normal circumstances, wouldn't have a beer together, we'll say. But they're interested in developing good neighborly relations and getting through what is bound to be a difficult time in the years ahead. That's a pretty good attitude to have. I suspect I avoided the question again. but I had actually my own different question. Um, which is, have you ever read anything about, or do you know anything about the capacity of what wilderness and what rural land base, what, whatever we have left in the United States, um, what ability that has to support more people? In a primitivist sense? In uh, sense, okay. Small agriculture sense. Yes, yes. Currently the way we grow food in this country, depending on whether you're a vegetarian or not, requires three to five acres to feed each person. So industrial agriculture requires three to five acres to feed each person. High intensity organic gardening, which is what I do, can support four to six people per acre. It's roughly a 20-fold increase in efficiency. So if we stop growing at scale, which benefits big ag, and start growing gardens, which benefits us, because it produces healthy food, then we can feed us all. That's, a, that's easy. That's a no-brainer. If we're willing, we can grow the food. I encourage, I strongly encourage you to get involved in the permaculture movement. And the, the woman who organized this trip, Penny Creebill, writes at Little Artrum, works at Little Artrum, and she's a permaculture design specialist. She puts on courses. Permaculture is more than food growing. It's a design process that allows you to efficiently supply your food, maintain your body temperature, supply your water, and so on. All those things we need to thrive in any era are supplied by the permaculture movement. Pursue that in the transition town movement and those two should be working together. Thank you all for coming. I will stay around as long as anybody wants to talk with me and I will be speaking again tomorrow morning. Thank you, one again, again.